Among the millions of Americans glued to their television sets for the shuttle launch was President Reagan. He watched in the Oval Office with his fingers crossed, he says. Then the president went out to the Rose Garden and announced triumphantly that America is back in space. We're now looking forward to the successful completion of the Discovery mission and the safe return of her five-member crew. We salute the bravery of Rick Hawk, Dick Covey, Pinky Nelson, Mick, Mike Lounge, and Dave Hilmers, and we ask God to bless this important voyage. Today's Discovery mission, the payload and experiment packages, is nothing like what it was originally supposed to be. Defense Department correspondent David Martin reports tonight, it's now mostly a test mission for a shuttle program that will never be the same again. Not for NASA, not for the Pentagon. Zero and liftoff. The flight of Discovery was originally intended to be a military mission launched from California's Vandenberg Air Force Base. But what was to have been the military's first spaceport is now in mothball, a three and a half billion dollar testament to the havoc wrecked by the Challenger accident. And it wasn't just the Challenger. Three months later, an unmanned Titan rocket carrying a spy satellite blew up shortly after launch. We also blew up a Delta at the same time, and that represents three-fourths of the launchers that the United States had at its disposal at that time, the fourth being the Atlas. And it pretty much immobilized the space program in the United States. The military's newest navigation satellite was supposed to be launched on the shuttle. But here it sits, part of the backlog of more than 20 military satellites. Even though NASA is building a fourth orbiter to replace Challenger, shuttle launches alone can't make up the lost ground. So the Pentagon is spending $10 billion on new rockets and launch pads. Never again will the military allow itself to become so dependent on the shuttle. The number of flights off the shuttle will decrease by the Department of Defense. We used to have all of them on the shuttle. Now we're going to a more balanced approach. We'll fly maybe three or four missions per year off the shuttle. The military has, in effect, decided that virtually everything it needs to do in space can be done without the help of man. There are those who say the same holds true for the scientific exploration of space. All of those things that you can postulate man can do, you can do better, cheaper, uh, with much less uh, technology uh, involved than if you try to accomplish the same thing with man involved. For the military, it was an easy decision. They simply could not afford the delays and costs of putting man into space. For the rest of society, the question of abandoning manned spaceflight is not so simple. To do that would cede the solar system to Soviet cosmonauts who already have established a continuous presence in space. David Martin, CBS News, the Pentagon. Now, with the shuttle back in business, the United States and 11 allied countries signed an agreement today to build a permanent space station for the free world. This plan calls for 22 shuttle missions over the next 10 years to get all the hardware into orbit. Space station freedom will cost $23 billion. That's to come from the United States, Japan, Canada, and the European Space Agency. The Soviets tried to steal some of Discovery's thunder today. For the first time, Soviet television showed off pictures of the Soviet Union's own version of the space shuttle. Theirs is yet to fly. The photos show it looks a lot like the U.S. space shuttle. It is widely believed the Soviets modeled theirs after the U.S. version. You know, it wasn't just the NASA people. It wasn't just fans of the space program. It wasn't just journalists who this day were pulling for NASA and the Discovery crew. It seemed like the whole world was watching, pausing, waiting for them to light it up and push the edge of the envelope again, waiting for the liftoff that would erase those clouds of doubt, replace the picture of the cloud that hung in the sky when Challenger exploded. Charles Osgood charted the many ways business was not as usual today. The day America paused, to dream again. T minus five minutes and counting. Those last moments counting down to the launch were anxious ones, and understandably so. Wherever we were, at home, school, work, or on our way, Americans by the millions paused this morning to hold our breath. T minus two minutes and counting. Whether it was a classroom in Quincy, Massachusetts, a shopping mall in Atlanta, a firehouse in San Francisco, or the freeways of Los Angeles, in public and in private. T minus 90 seconds and counting. Less than two you did not have to be a scientist at mission control or an engineering student at MIT to understand what this was. Even children knew this school in Palo Alto, California, 
is named for a challenger crewman. It is the Ronald McNair School. With the rest of us, they followed the countdown. T minus 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10. We're go for a main entrance start. Seven, six, start. At the other critical moment, separation of the booster, even the engineers were ready to smile. After so much pain and frustration, we could breathe a sigh of relief. It is only a beginning, a new beginning, but so far, so good. Liftoff, Americans return to space as Discovery clears the tower. Charles Osgood, CBS News, New York. And that's tonight's CBS Evening News. With congratulations to NASA and to the crew of Discovery, Dan Rather reporting from the Kennedy Space Center. Of course, we'll keep you up to date on any major shuttle flight developments, and later this evening, we hope you'll join us for 48 hours. Tonight entitled, Not on My Street, the story of the dramatic desegregation dispute in Yonkers, New York. That's at 8, 7 Central Time. So, see you again soon.